About six months into the pandemic, it seemed like our day-to-day -day life had changed entirely. Summer vacations were canceled, family reunions put on hold, weddings postponed. Even churches were empty. We found ourselves in a world where all the rules had changed, where the ground had shifted under our feet. Though many of us were working, attending school and church from the safety of our own homes, somehow we still felt displaced, anxious, uncertain. But what if God is at work in the midst of our feelings? What if God is reminding us that our true home is not an address and the church is not a building? As followers of Jesus, we're called to be a holy temple and a dwelling place for God. The church is us. It's you. It's me. We are the church. We are chapels on our street. And so this past year, we put our trust in God and kept doing what he has called us to do all along, to be a place to experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact. As a church family, we found new ways to worship God together. We stayed committed to regular prayer. Welcome to day 22 of our 22 days of prayer initiative. Welcome to another Friday morning prayer here at Chapel Street Church. Our ministries came up with creative ways that we could still gather. Alternative VBS, car boxes for Adventure Club, and virtual small groups. Welcome back to Wednesday Night Live! We had Wednesday Night Live to connect to each other and stay rooted in God's Word. Responding to the needs of the community, we opened a new Shepherd's Heart Care Center, serving about 1,400 people every month and we were able to do so completely debt-free. <laughs> we are launching a fourth campus in North Aurora this fall, also debt-free. We had a goal to raise $200,000 for Naomi's House, a program that brings hope and healing to women who have suffered from commercial sexual exploitation. Everything we do is geared toward how do we restore what was lost in the ugliness and the violence of trafficking. My life has forever been changed because of Naomi's house. Through our generosity as a church community, we didn't just meet this goal. We were able to give them 300,000. So even in the midst of a challenging year, full of uncertainty, we watched God move in incredible ways. Today, let's celebrate how God used his church and continues to use us to welcome people into his family. Our Charges Christ followers has never and will never change, no matter how drastically the world changes around us. Our home is in Him, and He is with us. So to everyone we say, welcome home. You know, it's such a good thing to look back and celebrate all that God has done. And uh, some of you have been part of that, whether online or in person. You've experienced uh, all these many things that God has done in our midst over this last year, really year and a half together. And we just give God all the praise and glory and look forward to what he will do in the future. The future feels uncertain to us, but it's not to our God. And if you've been with us online uh, or in person, you know we've just finished a series called Seven, The Seven Churches in Revelation, where we looked at the letters to these churches, which are really the letter to God's people, the church, at all times everywhere. It's been profoundly relevant for us to look at how God is speaking to us, his church, through these letters in this day and age. And this past week, Pastor Brian finished with Revelation chapter 3, the church at Laodicea. And he talked about Jesus standing at the door and knocking on the outside of a church, knocking to get in, a church that was wealthy and comfortable and had unintentionally moved Jesus to the outside. Today I want to talk to you about what it looks like individually and corporately for us to let him in. Because quite frankly, all of us at one time or another have left home or closed the door on God's love and he wants to call us all back home. You know, during this pandemic, uh, several months ago, a man said to me, you know, I'm, I've traveled for business all my life and all my working life. And over the last 12 months, I spend almost every day at home. 
And he goes, and yet I feel more restless and less at home internally than I've ever felt before in my life. Maybe that's not your experience. Maybe it is. But all of us, I think, can relate to the idea that being locked in our homes, quarantined or isolated, doesn't necessarily make you feel at home. In fact, it can make you feel more restless, more homesick or homeless in a way. So what does it mean to be at home, truly at home? It's got to mean more than our geography or our address. I've talked to many of you, many people who have changed addresses. They've moved during this pandemic. And it's been a good thing for them to pick up and move their family to another place. Or maybe it's been a hard thing. But home is much more than the place that you live. What is it, spiritually speaking? So many of the things we used to look for, for a sense of security and stability in our lives over the last year, have been up for grabs or even taken away. So if home is the place where you feel secure, accepted, welcomed, well, where is that exactly? Is it just your address? Is it just how you get, feel on a given day? Or is it something more, something deeper? That's exactly what I want to talk to you about from the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 15, this remarkable story that probably all of you have heard of, and maybe you think you know, maybe you do know by heart. The story we call the parable of the prodigal son. Perhaps among with a good Samaritan, uh, they're th th vying for the best known of all Jesus' parables. Certainly it's one that people have heard that phrase. We even use the phrase to refer to people that rebel or run away, that phrase. It's, it's a story, though, that has so many layers of meaning, so much depth and richness to it. That I, and I want to look at this story from the lens of what it means to leave home, to long for home, and then turn for home and be welcomed home in this story. That's what we're going to look at. So to understand the true power of the story, though, we need to understand a little bit of the setting in which Jesus told it, because it is a parable he told to make a point. And the point applies to us today, but let's understand who he's talking to when he first told it and what it meant to them at that time. Sometimes we, we miss this. And so let's look at Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 2. So I want you to notice a couple of groups here that are in the audience Jesus is speaking to um, as we go here. So first, now... The tax collectors and sinners, that's group number one, were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes, that's group number two, grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. There's that word, shows up two times. Now, we hear the word sinner, and we think, you know, we're, we're all sinful people. Nobody's perfect. Everybody's a sinner. That's not what it meant to the first century Jewish mind. To call someone a sinner or refer to sinners was a particular class in their society. Those who were deformed, diseased, i.e. cursed by God in their worldview, or those who were wicked by profession, prostitutes, thieves, robbers, and so on. A specific kind of people that were outcasts in society. So when he, we're told that there's two groups here, largely, tax collectors, those who are sellouts, and sinners, those who are outcasts, and Pharisees and scribes. Now, those are the religious experts. Those are the religious insiders. So, to put it briefly, you've got the outsiders and the insiders in the audience. And Jesus tells this story that we all think we know to address both groups very specifically. I want you to keep those groups in mind as we go forward. Because there's a tension, there's a conflict that starts right there in verse 2. I don't know if you saw it. This man receives sinners and eats with them. This is the conflict. Jesus is criticized for not just what he says and what he does, but the kind of people he associates with. Because there's a following gathering around Jesus. People are, are flocking to him, and this upsets the religious leaders. They don't like it. It threatens them. It, it is a, a threat to their authority and to their understanding of who God is and how he works. And so there, he's, Jesus is constantly criticized for associating with these outsiders, uncleans, undesirables. Why is he with them? And this is why Jesus tells the story. I remember a man years ago who said to me, we were getting to know each other. We were, uh, I was coaching our, both of our sons in, in flag football. And he said, you know, Pastor Jeff, I'm just not the kind of guy that God is interested in. If you knew my story, he said, you'd know I'm just not the kind of guy God is interested in. That was a fascinating statement to make. It tells a lot about what's going on in that man's heart. And I told him as we got to know each other, actually, you're exactly the kind of guy God is interested in. He's interested in those of us who feel like outsiders and those of us who think we're insiders. But, but he tells the story for both groups. So um, the basic plot of the Bible in terms of the, the, what it means for us to leave home uh, is that we are all made for a home with God. We'll see that as point one here. We are all made for a home with God. 
This is in Genesis chapter 1, in the garden. God made everything, and it's good, and we're in good relationship with him. But we're all homeless as a result of sin. We've left home. God didn't abandon us. We abandoned him. And that was true then, and it's true now. And third, we're all trying to find our way back home. In different ways, we're doing this. We're trying to find our way home. So this is the basic description of the human condition in the Bible. We're made for home with God. We left home as a result of our own sin, and we're desperately trying to find our way home. Although we don't know, we've lost our way. We don't know how to get back home. And the message of the gospel is that Jesus, God, makes a way back for us in Christ. And that's at the heart of why Jesus tells this story. The problem is many of us are trying to do this on our own steam. We're trying to earn our way back, to create our way back, to uh, based on our own philosophy, our own strength, our own terms, our own uh, identity. And there's three, I want to give you three prevalent paradigms today for how people try to find their way home, as it were. Uh, number one, the religious paradigm. This simply means that your moral effort uh, and goodness is what saves you. That your pursuit of moral goodness saves you. And you can be religious about lots of things. Number two, the spiritual paradigm. This is, you must find, or in our culture, create your own truth. Self-determined, your own spiritual, a DIY, do-it-yourself spirituality. That I, what seems right to me, I've tried these different philosophies, I've studied these different religions, and I've put together what, my own spiritual path. And the third is the secular paradigm. This simply means, this life is all that there is, and so we have to do all we can to make it the best life we can because you only go around once. And there's lots of different nuances and variables that fit into each of these, but essentially, these are three ways people are trying to find their way home, spiritually speaking or internally. And we all tend to hear the message of the gospel, if we do hear it, through our own paradigm, on our own terms. Tim Keller uh, writes, Jesus' purpose in this parable and in all of his stories is not to warm our hearts or affirm our ideology but to shatter our paradigms. So you might think of this parable of the prodigal son as the, par as the paradigm-breaking parable. It's given to us to shake us up into what we think we know, then and now. Jesus doesn't come to improve or revise our lives. He comes to give us a new life. And to do that, he's got to deconstruct, in a way, what we think we know about who he is and what this life means. So let's look at the story. Luke 15, 11 through 16. And he said, Jesus, there was a man who had two sons. Interestingly here, these two sons are, are, are two of the key characters in the story. And we think of this as the parable of the prodigal son. But actually, it's the parable, Jesus doesn't call it that. It's a parable about two sons. We'll get to them. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. Now, that phrase right there could be used to mean he left home, he's far from home. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And spent everything, a severe, after he spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Now, this is a Jewish young man, who's hit, this is a picture of absolute rock bottom to first century Jewish mind. He's feeding pigs, unclean animals, living off of the, the pig slop, quite literally. And he was longing to be fed with the pods the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. See the picture here? This is, this is the picture of what's happened to him. He has fig literally and figuratively left home. He actually has left home, and he's far from home, if home is the heart of the father, spiritually speaking. So we use the younger brother's name to refer to the rebellious or, or uh, stubborn or irresponsible kids, but this is so much more than that. In verse 12, it's a shockingly offensive thing he says to his father. He says, give me the share of the inheritance that's coming to me. Give me what's coming to me. Now, you have to understand... In that day, a family's wealth was not in a 401k or a bank account or investments or stocks that could be liquidated. It was in the land. It was in livestock. It was in crops. It was in property. So in order to give this son, 
one-third, which is what he was entitled to as the younger of two, son, two brothers, he had to liquidate, sell off land, sell off livestock, one-third of the family's total wealth and give it away to the son. So what the son, which he would not get that until the father died, he's effectively saying, Dad, I don't want to wait around for you to kick the bucket. I want what's mine now. I wish you were dead, is what he's saying. It's a horribly offensive thing to say. Total disdain for his father. Total disregard for the future and security of his clan. He's saying, I don't care what happens to the family. I just want my wealth, what's mine. Because if you take out, if you take out a third of the family's wealth, that diminishes what they have to live on, what they have to grow and to produce. He demands, you know, his rights without responsibility. He demands the riches of the inheritance without the riches of his family. He disconnects himself from his true inheritance, which is the love of the father and the family and the security that brings. It's rebellion against God. It's rebellion that always leads to brokenness. Now, remember the two audiences, the sinners and the religious leaders, the younger brother represents who? It's pretty clear, isn't it? Jesus tells a story so that the, those who feel like they're outsiders would identify with this younger brother. Oh yeah, that's us. We're on the outside. We're the ones that everyone looks at as if, as if we've broken all the rules and are far, far, in a far country. He was far from his father and far from his father's heart. Did it ever occur to you when you think about this story? that that younger brother already had everything he was asking for. He demanded something he already had and more. All that he wanted was his and so much more. And actually by demanding it, he gets less in the process. Rebellion, rejection of God always leads to brokenness, now and eventually. And the message of the Bible that we've all, in a sense, left home spiritually in one way or another. Uh, we're told that he is in need. This is physical brokenness and homelessness. That he longs to feed himself with, the, with the, the pods of the pigs. He's feeding pigs. This is moral homelessness and brokenness. And that no one gave him anything. This is relational brokenness. He doesn't have anyone. He's homeless in every way. Henry Nouwen writes this, Leaving home means ignoring the truth that God has formed me in his own image, that he's knit me together in my mother's womb. And leaving home is living as though I do not have a home, and I must look and work to find one. We've all done that. We've all lived our lives as if we're not made in the image of God. We get to determine our own identity in different ways. We all have a tendency to, to forget that we have a home, but we're trying to build our own on our own terms. And usually this happens little by little. It doesn't happen in all of a sudden. The story is kind of abrupt. We just, the, the son just goes to dad and says, give me the money. But what led him to, to the place where he would say that? What's going on in his heart and mind? In my experience with talk as a pastor with people that have, are in broken places, people don't wake up one morning and say, today I'm going to betray all my convictions. I'm going to damage all my closest relationships. And I'm going to wreck my life. Just seems like the right day to try it. People don't do that. It happens little by little over time. We leave home little by little, little steps away from the heart of the Father, little compromises. And over time, eventually, we find our place, ourselves in a place that we don't understand how we got there. I mean, can you imagine the son saying, today I'm going to damage the most important relationship in my life, my father. I'm going to waste all that I have on meaningless pursuits. And I hope, when it's all said and done, that I could end up penniless, homeless, and sitting in filth. <laughs> Who has that as a life goal? Nobody. Now, let's leave the younger brother for a minute, and let's jump to the end of the story and look at the older brother, the other brother. We'll come back to the resolution of the younger brother at the end, but I want to get a, you to get a picture of the older brother for just a minute and what, how he has left home, even though he doesn't actually physically leave home. So let's look at the story of the older brother in verses 25 to 30. Now, so the younger son has come home. Now, the older son was in the field. He's working for dad. He's being the good son. As he came and drew near the house, he heard music and dancing. So you got the picture? He's coming back, and he's thinking, what's going on? There's a party happening. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he's received him back safe and sound. But he, the brother, was angry and refused to go in. In where? Into the house, into the party, into the banquet. 
he, his uh, father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, wait, I think we missed a slide there. Go back one. Nope. Okay. Go forward. My bad. Came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you, and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, do you catch that? How the younger brother refers to his brother? Not as my brother, but as this son of yours, who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed the fattened calf for him. And the father says this. Do we have that? No. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what the father says. Apparently, we've missed a slide here. The father says this in response to him in, in, um, in verse 30 and 31. He said, son, you are always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. So the father says, all I have is yours. You're always with me. What are you angry about? We have to celebrate. The father says to him, this brother of yours. The brother says, this son of yours. It's very telling what's going on. Now, think about the older brother for a minute. If Jesus is talking to two groups, the sinners, the outsiders, and the religious leaders, the insiders, who's the older brother? You see what he's doing in the story? He's, he's pressing on both of their hearts. Those religious leaders, those insiders who judge Jesus because he's hanging out with all the wrong people are the older brothers in the story. What's their relationship with their father like? Think about it for a minute. The younger brother sees his father based on what he can give him. I don't really want you, Dad. I want your wealth. I want what you can give me. But if you think about it, so does the older brother. Why is the older brother angry when the son comes back, when his brother comes back? Because for the father to welcome him back, put a robe on him, put a ring on his finger, kiss him, and make him a son again, means he is now entitled to another third of the family wealth. Think about this. He's already blown a third. So the family inheritance is reduced by one third. Now the boy's back and he gets another third, full inheritance, full rights as a son. The older brother thinks that's coming out of my share. He's getting what I deserve. That's why he's resentful and angry because of what he thinks it's going to cost him. You know, when the boy left, when his brother left, he doesn't say a word in protest. We don't hear a, a word from him. We don't even hear about him. But he's got plenty to say when his brother comes home. In the ancient world, it's the older brother who should have been the mediator. It's shameful for the family to have this younger brother leave like this. It brings shame on the family. So the one to pursue him, the one to plead with him not to leave, the one to try to reason with him and reconcile him back to the father should have been the older brother. And he doesn't do that. He only speaks up in bitterness and resentment and arrogance when his brother comes home. This older brother is a picture of self-righteous and moral superiority. But here's the thing you need to keep in mind. Both brothers are far from the heart of the father. Both of them are far from home. If home equals the heart of the father, then they both left home. In fact, actually, the older brother is outside, isn't he? He won't come into the house, the actual physical house, because he's in there. The father has to go out to talk with him. My son, come in. This brother of yours is home. Maybe some of you can hear God say that to you. Maybe you've got judgmentalism in your heart. Maybe you've got resentment in your heart. Maybe there are groups of people that you think those people don't deserve the grace of God. You wouldn't say it out loud, but if you're honest, you think those things. And God is saying to you, my son, my daughter, come in. Come in. There's room for you. You lack nothing. All I have is yours, he said. You're not missing out on anything. The only way you miss out is staying outside. Why do you think the father leaves the, the feast to go find his son? Because he loves him. Because he loves him. He wants him to come home, to come in from his self-righteousness, to come in from his arrogance and his bitterness and his resentment. He says, you're always with me. All I have is yours and this brother of yours. Pleading with him. These two brothers, they look very different on the outside. That's, that's part of the magic of this story. They look like totally different on the outside. 
One is this, this sinful, obviously broken and desperate rebel. And the other is the one who stays at home, works in the field, the good son. The neighbors are proud of him. You must be so proud of your older son. He's such a faithful boy. He's such a good boy. I wish my son was like that. They look very different on the outside. But if you peel back the layers of their heart, they're the same. They're both far from the heart of the father. They both see their dad for what he, they think he can give them, not for his own heart. They don't understand his love. Both are far from home. Okay, let's go back now and look at verses 17 through 24 and see how um, the younger son is reconciled back because this is really what it means for all of us to come home. Verses 17 through 24. But when he came to himself, that's a powerful phrase. Some, some translations say when he came to his senses. When he woke up, when he realized, how did I get here? This is not where I want to be. What happened in my life that I ended up in this condition? He said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven. This is crucial. I have sinned against heaven and against you, before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. This is the crucial phrase right here. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, and ran, look at that, and embraced and kissed him. It's hard to read that, honestly, without getting emotional. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. For my son was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found, and they began to celebrate. It's such an amazing story. There's so much in there for us. Now, that phrase in verse 17, when he came to himself, he has a spiritual awakening. He realizes, what have I done? How did I get here? But he knows. He, he cannot go just go back to his father and assume that he's a son again. He knows he can't just return as if nothing happened. There was in the ancient culture, uh, Middle Eastern culture, there is today, a ceremony called the Kazaza ceremony. If you betrayed the family honor, if you left uh, the family and, and associated with people that were uh, uh, unclean or outsiders, if you did something that dishonored or brought shame on your family, the, the father or the elders of a village would go to the edge, when you, if you tried to return home, the edge of the, the family estate or the village gate, and they would take a large pot before you and smash it into pieces on the ground to symbolize our relationship is broken, it's shattered, it's irreparable, there's no coming back. That doesn't happen in this story. When the son comes back to the father, there's no shattered pot. It's the opposite. The father runs down the road. I want, to, I want you to think about this. The younger son gets two things right about himself, but one thing completely wrong about his father. What does he get right? He gets his confession right. Did you catch it? He said, I've sinned against heaven and against you. This is what David says in Psalm 51. Against you and you only have I sinned. Well, wait a second. What about the people you've sinned with or against? There are both horizontal consequences of our sin, but ultimately speaking, there's a vertical consequence. The son knows what I've done is not just an offense against you, my earthly father, but against my heavenly father. He gets his confession right. And second, he gets his condition right. He says, I'm not worthy to be called your son. He thinks, hire me on, make me a servant. Maybe I could, over time, earn my way back into your good graces, or at least I won't starve and I'll be a hired hand. I'd set up for that. Now, he's right. He's not worthy to be called a son. He isn't worthy, and neither are you, and neither am I. None of us on our own are worthy. We have all, the Bible says, left home spiritually, rebelled against our father, seen him as someone to meet our needs if we care about him at all. But here's what he gets wrong. 
he gets the heart of his father completely wrong. He totally misses that. I imagine him coming back home and rehearsing his speech, right? Father, I've sinned against heaven against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Just let me back in. Like he's thinking it through. How am I going to say this? And he starts into it. And the father sees him, right? But did you catch what the father does? While he was a long way off, the father saw him. How would that happen unless the father's looking for him? Isn't it? Think about the father who's been betrayed, who's had his heart broken, looking every day. Is my son coming home? Is he coming home? Maybe he sent messengers to find him. Maybe he sent his servants to plead with him to come home. And every day he's looking down the road, and then he sees him a long way off. And what does the father do? Who does he think he is coming back here? Get the pot ready. We're going to smash it right in front of him. No. He runs down the road, sprints down the road. And, and in the ancient world, uh, the father would be wearing long regal robes, you know, a symbol of his authority and his, uh, and his status in the family. For a, 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 an adult Jewish man to run was somewhat undignified because to do so, you have to pick up your robes and run with your bare legs down the road. But he doesn't care about his dignity and his honor. He cares about his son. And he runs down the road. Before the boy can get a few words out, he embraces him. He kisses him. He puts a robe on him and a ring on him. Those are symbols, by the way, of his status in the family. He's saying, you're not a hired hand. And here's the thing. You cannot earn your way back to the father. That's what the son thinks. Well, I'll, I'll work it off. I'll pay off my debt. I'll, I'll pay it back what I owe. I'll, I'll, over time, maybe he'll see that I'm sincere. I think so many of us approach God that way. You know, I know I've screwed up. I know I've made a mess of my life. I know I'm, I'm, I don't deserve it. But, if, you know, maybe just give me another chance, and I promise I'll be better this time. You cannot earn your way back to the heart of the Father. You can only turn, come to your senses, turn for home, and receive the embrace and the kiss which is, those are pictures of grace. The boy doesn't deserve that, and he knows that. I think verse 20 is the heart of the gospel in one verse. Let me read it for you. Uh, it, it, it reads this way. And he arose and came to his father. That's our part. That's what we do. Come to our senses and turn and head for the, for the father. But while he was a long way off, his father saw him, felt compassion, ran, embraced him, and kissed him. Right in one verse, that's the gospel. At some point, God's working in our hearts and we recognize we're in the wrong place, we're far from home, and we turn back to the Father and He runs to us in Jesus, embraces us, and kisses us. The love of the Father, friends, calls us home. The story is not about the younger son or the older son. And Timothy Keller wrote a book called The Prodigal God. The word prodigal, uh, it comes from the root word prodigious, uh, it, but it, it means extravagant, lavish. So the younger son was extravagant and lavish in his reckless life. But really, the story at its heart is about the extravagant and lavish love of God. The prodigious love of God. And that's represented in, how, in who the father is. The, the love of the father calls us home. First, it's an initiating love. Who initiates? The son turns for home, but it's because of the love of the father. The father runs down the road to meet the son. The father goes out of the feast to get the older brother. The father is initiating with his sons who are both far from home. 1 John 4.10 tells us, it's not that we love God. This is love. Not that you love God, but that he loved you and sent his son as atoning sacrifice for your sins. God is the initiator. If you're watching this and you feel even the slightest prick in your heart to return to the father, if there's a part of you that longs to know his embrace, that's because God is initiating with you. That's his spirit moving in you, prompting you. And second, it's a sacrificing love. Now, to come back to the family is free to the younger brother, but it's not free to the father, is it? It costs him something. And it's not free to the older brother. And one of the lesser known parts of this story is that the older brother, the father represents the heart of God, the older brother represents the opposite of who your true older brother is. And that's Jesus. The older brother should have interceded. Jesus does. The other older brother should have pursued. Jesus does. The older brother should have sacrificed. Jesus does. He's our true older brother. It's a sacrificing love. There's cost to come back into the family. It's free to us, but it costs our, our, our father everything. It's an interceding love. Romans 8, 34, we're told that Jesus, he gives himself up as a sacrifice, and now he's ascended to heaven at the right hand of the father interceding for us. It's a reconciling love. Why, why does the older brother refuse to go into the, the party? 
because of the younger brother. Now, I don't know this is true, but I imagine maybe the dysfunctional relationship between older brother and younger brother is part of the reason the younger brother left home. Part of the reason he wanted out, because it was a messed up situation. The older brother refuses to go into the party precisely because of the younger brother. This, by the way, is exactly the criticism of what's happening in 15 verse 2. Remember that? The tax collectors and the Pharisees and the scribes, the teachers of the law, the religious insiders say about Jesus, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Well, that's what's going on. The sinner, the younger brother, has come home. And he's inside having a feast. And I'm not going in there because he's in there. Well, who misses out? The older brother does. It's interesting to me that in this story, we know what happens to the younger brother. We know that he comes home and is welcomed and receives grace and is restored. We don't know what happens to the older brother. The story doesn't tell us, did he come inside? Did he humble himself? Did he ask for forgiveness? Did he receive the father's love the same way the younger son did? Or does he stay out there, arms folded, bitter and resentful and angry? We don't know. It's natural for us to think about the younger brother and the elder brother that we know in our lives. I'm guessing some of you right now can think of people in your life that fit either category, either paradigm. Maybe you know some prodigals that have run away, actually run away, or are far from God. Maybe you know some older brothers, some people that are judgmental in the church. They've hurt you, maybe. They've judged you. They've been resentful toward you or about you, or they've made you feel like an outsider. But before we start thinking about the people we know who fit those categories, I want you just to take a moment and say, where are you in this story? Because the point you cannot miss, you must not miss, is that the father loves them both. The father desperately loves both his sons, all his sons, all his daughters. Those of us who have wandered away and made a mess of things, those of us who have stayed home and tried to follow all the rules but still are far from God in our heart. And everyone in between, the father loves this is the heart of the gospel, friends. The gospel is for all people at all times and all places. And we need to find ourselves in this story. Jesus is inviting us to come home. He's inviting you. If you're like the younger brother, if you feel like I'm just not the kind of guy God's interested in, I'm just not the kind of girl or woman that God cares about, you're wrong. He does. He longs for you to come home. He's watching for you, waiting for you, runs down the road to meet you. And if you're perhaps looking around inside the church maybe, been around the church your whole life, looking out at the world thinking, what's wrong with those people who voted this way, who, see, who have these, uh, these opinions or these ideas? They're the problem in the world. And when, they, when they, you see them start to maybe soften toward God, you almost get resentful. What are they doing? They don't belong here. God is calling you, the Father's calling you to come in from the back porch of bitterness and resentment and judgmentalism. Because both of us need to have our paradigms broken. If I'm honest, I have been the younger brother at times in my life. There have been seasons in my life when I was younger, when I was, I was that, running, rebelling, outwardly and inwardly. But if I'm honest, more recently, there's an older brother lurking in my heart. There's a judgmental tendency in me. And I hear the voice of the Father say to me, Jeff, why are you on the back porch with your arms folded, angry and resentful? Come into the party. Come into the feast of my love and grace. This is where life is. This is the heart of the Father. God longs to welcome us all home. And it's inside the Father's house and his love that he begins to change us. That he begins to reconcile us, not just to himself, but to each other. Where we begin to call each other brother and sister again. Not them or they. So friends, wherever you are, spiritually speaking, however far from home you feel or have wandered, the heart of the Father calls you home. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this ancient story which we've only scratched the surface of. But we thank you for its profound relevance to every human heart at all times everywhere. That you, God, have the heart of a good, gracious, and loving Father. That our heart's true home is with you. Forgive us for running away, rejecting, or for staying right at home but acting as if we deserve it or we're entitled to it. None of us are worthy to be called your sons or daughters. And yet because of your love and grace, that's what you call us. Help us to come to ourself, to turn back to you, and to receive the grace that you long to give. We pray this in your name and for your sake. Amen. Thanks for being with us. 
I hope that you all will feel the heart of the Father calling you home. That you would turn to him, receive his embrace, know the kiss of his grace, and feel the goodness of his love. Amen. And go in peace. Thank you.